How y'all doing? Tonight, tonight, whenever you listen to this, I'm recording it tonight. We're looking at the book Spiritual Formation as If Church Mattered, Growing in Christ Through Community. Now, I wanted you to have this book and I wanted you to digest this book because it looks at discipleship and integrates it with worship. And it asks a lot of questions that almost feel like they're coming in the side door, but man, when they show up, they really pop. And so this book, I get that you may not be reading it cover to cover, and in some ways you don't have to read it cover to cover. It is a book that is really actually broken up well in segments and in chapters. Uh, I call it kind of a post-it note of a really good thought that he finally had to figure out how to align it all up to have some sense of coherence. Will Hot in Spiritual Formation as If the Church Mattered, you will find sermons in here that are just ready to preach, and you will find content in here for worship that is going to help grow uh, your tr- help help your worship services become a place where people take their next step in faith in Jesus Christ. So he's got this overarching question there in the chapter that we read: How do we as a church receive people? How do we welcome people? And if we just have this most baseline assumption that worship is the primary front door for people into your church, especially after we heard about the ways, uh, as I heard you describe the congregations that you're a part of, 95% of congregations, the front door is showing up for the first time on Sunday morning for worship. There might be a few other things. If you've got a building that almost doubles as a community center, people might be able to get a sense of who your church is by coming to an AA group or a a community event at your congregation, that's great. But let's be honest, when someone decides to make your church their church or want to get curious about faith, it's going to be through the worship service. So how do you welcome people? How do you receive people in worship? Now, there's just a long litany of good work and bad work around how to be welcoming through your worship service to new people. There's good ways where you kind of have to ask uh, questions about is our worship service accessible to people with very little Christian memory? Uh, do we have too much Christian insider language? Do we make too many assumptions about what people are, uh, what what people know? What is it? Make sure I get this joke right. Uh, in the it's only in the Disciples of Christ where someone says the president of the CWF is working with the CYF to work with a DHM project, and no one is confused by that. Well, guess what? Everybody is confused by that unless they've gone to disciples churches for 25 years. So what we're looking at is what is flexible and nimble in worship, what is not, and then how do you have a generous spirit to receive people from a worship service that is more than what goes on in the foyer. So we're looking at more than friendly. I'll talk about friendly here in a second. But how? what is the theology that you are communicating that welcomes people and is able to receive people on a Sunday morning? And that is more than having a, a band up front and a minister that preaches without a rope. Nothing wrong with any of those things one way or another. We're looking to something deeper. So let me ask you, let me go through a series of talking points till I get to the punchline of what um, is talked about here and that we're going to talk about on our discussion forum. We receive when we think about receiving new people into our community through Sunday morning worship, we have to take serious, we do have to take seriously the physical act of hospitality. When I've never met a church that doesn't think they're friendly. I've never worked with a church in kind of a mild consulting role where people say, you know, the problem with our church is that we're all rude, arrogant, and we hate new people. But the fact of the matter is hospitality has to be intentional. Hospitality has to be programmed. Hospitality has to um, actually almost become like a conveyor belt of welcoming people. What do you do on a Sunday morning through the physical human expression of hospitality, pre-COVID, post-COVID, not during COVID, to let people know we're glad you're here? Part of receiving new people into our community is the recognition that we're glad that you are here. We are glad that you are here. Now, you can read some books. Some are better than others. There is a book called We're Glad uh, We're Glad to Have You, or no, We're Glad That You're Here by Tom Rayner that's worth looking at. Um, you know it in, in, in your church better than I do, but man, you got to have somebody. I would, I would think you need to have somebody in your parking lot that greets people. You need to have somebody at your foyer that greets people. We have uh, multiple people at our church that just roam the pews and roam our worship spaces on the lookout for new people. Now, you might be in a church that's so small that when somebody comes, 
everybody knows who they are because everybody knows everybody. But at the same time, they, you can tell that they're new to that worshiping community. You still want to communicate warmth. Can you go overboard? Absolutely. Can you make somebody uncomfortable? I'm sure you can. But if you're going to violate one of the two principles that you're too friendly or not friendly enough, I would rather have a, a story told that I went to that church and everybody st uh, stopped me to say hello. That's a good story. So we think about the physical act of receiving new people. That's kind of the easy one. That's the low hanging fruit. And in some ways, that's what we would call technical change. It's no big deal. It's not difficult to make that happen. But the second thing when we get into worship services is we have to look at the way that our space is a way to receive people. How is the space that we have set apart for worship conducive for receiving new people into our community? Easiest way to figure this out is not to roam your worship space and determine the pews are too tight or there's a blind spot that nobody knows about that you can't quite see the pulpit right, or there's a dead space with the sound. Don't do that at your church. Go to somebody else's church and go on a Sunday morning and go to a church where nobody knows anybody, and you'll be able to get a sense of what their hospitality is right, like, but then you will get a sense of what, what you're blind to in terms of worship uh, hospitality through the space about the way that your space is designed to receive people. I know it sounds really weird, but uh, when you come into a new worship space, I want to see, you know, where is the where is the preacher going to stand? I know that sounds kind of odd, but there are things that you can do to make people, uh, to that you can utilize to create a space that is receiving of new people. Those are the two that you'd kind of have some control over in terms of human logistics of the physical act of hospitality, and then taking seriously your physical space as a way of receiving new people. But then we get to the real issue. It took me seven minutes to get here. It's like a sermon. Uh, the real issue is, do you have a theology of worship that is passionate about receiving new people into your community? Do you have a worship service that is designed to receive new people into your community. One of the phrases that we've talked about on our Zoom call, as well as in our mess on our on our message board and our forum, was that this is kind of the way we've always done it. You know, I don't want to stretch the people people too far. I get that, but I need you to know something. Your worship service communicates something to new people. Does it communicate that you are glad that they are there? Does it communicate, or does it communicate? That if you haven't been here for five years and don't know what's happening, we're just going to roll right through and not find a way to bring an on, to create an on ramp to bring you along with us. That's one of the metaphors that I really like about uh, public communication in the pulpit, as well as the whole worship design. There should be an on ramp every five or seven minutes that for everybody that couldn't quite follow along what was just happening, that they can come back online. Let me be real honest here. I'm whispering as if it. It's not going to be on video. Communion is an off-ramp for me. I know I'm not supposed to say this, but uh, this summer we were having four worship services to space everybody out for COVID. Four straight services with communion. I'm, I'm here to tell you, man, I was not feeling the body and the blood. But what followed next was an on-ramp to bring me back on. So if we are to have a worship design, that is welcoming to receiving new people and crafted in such a way that we do not assume an institutional Christian memory of every person that comes in. We are going to look at what Will Hoyt calls optimistic brokenness. I love that phrase. I, I, I want to steal it and write a book about it. Optimistic brokenness. This is the theological a prism through which I view the creation of worship in the message that we wish to communicate. Do we have an optimistic brokenness for the people that we are longing to worship with and receive into our faith? So when we're passionate about receiving new people, there's going to be a, a pull sometimes to say we got to completely reinvent ourselves. There will be changes that you need to make in order to be a hospitable church that is welcome to receiving new people, to be a receiving community. But my hunch is 
we don't have a theology that is prepared to receive new people. So it doesn't matter if you put up a screen. I'm all about screens. It doesn't matter if you get a good band. I love good bands. It doesn't matter if you let people bring coffee into the sanctuary. If you do not have a theological framework of your entire worship service, your entire preaching series, your entire understanding of, of the Lord's Supper, of communion, that communicates optimistic brokenness. Now, I love that he pairs these two words together in this paradox. We, let's begin with the second one. Brokenness. There is something wrong with the world. In late January of 2021, do you think there's anybody in our country that doesn't think that there is something deeply flawed with what's going on in our lives and in our world? Brokenness is the bedrock assumption of almost everybody that is younger than me. Our politics are obsessed with everything that is wrong with the world. I don't want to go on that diatribe. But if you listen even to people on the far left and the far right, and I've got my per persuasion and preferences and all that, make no mistake, uh, everybody thinks the world is messed up. The easiest way to gather an audience is to talk about what is wrong with the world, but we got to push beyond that. A theology of worship that is able to receive new people into community acknowledges the brokenness that is within inside all of us. In some ways, it's easy to talk about all that is wrong with the world, but we are called to press further beyond that, to have a theology of worship that acknowledges that the brokenness in the world is, uh, the, the leading contributed factor of that is the brokenness that is within inside each and every one of us. And collectively, we contribute to the sinfulness and the brokenness of the world. What hymns do you sing that speak to the deep pain that is below the surface in the lives of a 26-year-old? What brokenness do you speak of in your sermon that talks about how difficult it is for people that are 63 years old who only have one goal, and that's to get on Medicare? And that's not a bad goal, but are fighting and holding on because they feel themselves caught up in a grinding system to where they can't quit work, but they can barely work. How are you getting to the deep pain and brokenness inside of that person? There is brokenness just below the surface. Now, I'm going to go on a rant here, so just hold on and buckle up tight. The biggest problem with the disciples of Christ, and I may never be asked back to teach at this school by saying this, so God bless you all. We don't know how to talk about sin we don't know how to talk about sin. We don't know how to talk about brokenness. And if we do, it tends to be larger rather than personal. And the Bible speaks about both. I'm telling you, man, if you want to get the ear of people outside of the church and receive them into the community of your faith, how are you communicating in your worship service the theological truth that we are broken people? Now, here's the good news. God does not leave us in our brokenness. So there is this pairing of brokenness and optimism. Optimistic brokenness. Optimistic brokenness. Optimism recognizes that we are not cemented in our soul, that we do not have to stay where we are. God has a plan and a purpose and a dream to slowly remember and reconstruct and, re and reconcile our lives, our communities, our churches, and let that be the, most con the largest contributing factor to the reconciliation and the restoration of the world. I think that's the whole aim of, of human history, is that the renewal of the world through the coming of Christ to make that which is broken right. And so we believe in a God who puts lives back together and then pushes us back into the world to become advocates for justice and putting the world back together the way God would dream of it. How are you communicating in your worship service the limitless capacity of human potential when we have the wind of the Holy Spirit at our back? I'm here to tell you, folks, when you craft worship and you pair together this optimistic brokenness, you will hit dead center on the on the, you will you will you will hit to the dead center of what I believe the gospel is, 
and hit dead center of the receptivity of every single heart that knows that something is deeply wrong with them and with the world and that God can do a man, you know, can, God can do more than we could ever dream and imagine to move us into the future that God would have for us. So when we come to crafting worship, there's one thing that most disciples churches do not do that I would encourage you to take seriously. And that is a communal confession of sin. I, I wrote a paper on this in my doctoral program. Um, I think that there is power in every week reciting a shared prayer that is well-crafted, that speaks to the broken nature of both ourselves and the world, the sinful nature of both ourselves and the world. And you can begin to pair that with um, the assurance of pardon and the assurance of grace. Will Hoyt talks about this in terms of the role of confession in worship. And so those of us that are architects of Christian worship, you have a little wiggle room here. You have a little control here. Um, you, I don't know how much pushback you would get to saying we really need to ask God to forgive us because we are broken people. It's just, I, I think you can probably get some pretty good theological footing to, to make this shift. In our church, we do a unison prayer at our 11 o'clock service. It's early on in the service. We do a unison prayer that is followed by what we would normally call a pastoral prayer. We call it the morning prayer. But um, Mark, who is going to uh, talk with us on Thursday, he crafts that unison prayer every week, and he always finds a way to hit the nail on the head about the, the inherent sinfulness of humanity and then the power of God to pull us together. There's an optimistic brokenness in, his, in those prayers that we pray every week. So if you are looking to, um, you're looking to that final paper about new things that you can implement, you're thinking about how you can take this class and put it into practice in the church where you're the music minister, the associate minister, or you're, you're all of the above. Uh, take seriously what it means to confess sin in worship. I do not believe that we live in a world anymore where mainline churches are going to get um, pigeonholed as churches that preach heavy sense of judgmentalism and condemnation. What I do think is that as inclusive communities that we are, regardless of where we find ourselves, urban, rural, suburban, mainline churches tend to be much more welcoming, even if there's still ways that we should go on that front. If you are a welcoming church that preaches and worships in a way that invites people into optimistic brokenness, I think that's the intersection of, of the 21st century church is that we are an inclusive community that is optimistic about what God can do with broken people. All right. Thank you all. Looking forward to our time together this Thursday. And I, um, I'm going to start grading all your papers tomorrow on Monday. So hopefully I'll get that done by Wednesday. So thank you all very much.